the chairman, Mr. Shivasaga, chairman of this August Museum, trustees of this museum, uh, Mr. Mukherjee, and ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, let me thank uh, Sh Mr. Shivasaga, the chairman, and the trustees for doing me the honor of speaking on this great man, you know, in memory of this great man, the 25th uh, lecture. Before I start my lecture, please forgive me if I say a few words about Karl Khandalawala. There's a certain amount of nostalgia at the moment when I speak about him. I think he was perhaps a great Renaissance scholar of India. That's how I would put it. He was steeped in the knowledge of art and culture, all forms of art and real culture of this country. Name it, and he was a really master at it. But the interesting thing to me was that he was a self-taught person. He taught himself by traveling across the country from Khandar in Afghanistan down to the East Coast, from North to South. What he did was visit museums, visit personal collections, making a great study of them. And that was, I think, a really phenomenal thing. And he made himself one of the greatest collectors and the greatest art historians. He's written several, several books. I say Renaissance because he was also a good lawyer. In fact, one of the best criminal lawyers of his time. He rode very well. He had to give up riding when his back hurt him. And he also, as he was told, for a short time was a navigator in the Air Force during World War II. I say nostalgia because I will tell you a small story. I was perhaps the junior most consultant at the Parsi General Hospital. There were many more senior experienced physicians at that point in time. I was the last on the list. And the front desk tells me, the reception says, sir, there is a patient admitted under your care. His name is Mr. Khandalawala, and he wants you to look after him. I knew the name Mr. Khandalawala. I'd never seen him. But I said, fine, I'll go and see him. So I walk up to him, and here was a man with a penciled moustache, a Hercule Poirot moustache, really. <laughs> Hercule Poirot of Agatha, Agatha Christie fame. And he looked down over his spectacles. I said, good morning to you. He said, good morning. I said, uh, tell me, are you by any chance related to Mr. Karl Khandalawala? <laughs> and he had a you know, fine smile over his face, an impish smile over his face. He said, well, I am Karl Khandalawala. Anyway, I looked after him for 15 days. We became good friends. And I refused to charge him. And he insisted, and I said, no, I won't charge you such a distinguished individual. I'm a professional person. Whether I charge a person or don't charge a person is my business. So he said, well, then I will have to give you a gift. I said, all right, depends on what gift it is. So he got me a book, and he told me, this is a very rare book. It is totally out of print just now. So I looked at a huge big one. It was called South Indian Bronzes. That book somehow or the other didn't come up here. He says it's one of my favorite books, and uh, I think you will like it. Ladies and gentlemen, I made 10 valiant attempts to read that book, but I stopped at page 10. <laughs> but it's still a great memory of a great soul. Now, let me start on my talk. The talk, as you know, is on tabiat, which means in Gujarati, Hindi, Urdu, Marathi, health. And then I said health and medicine, medicine and healing in, in India. The word health is a comparatively recent word in the English language. It's derived from the old English health, H-E-O-L-T-H. And the definition was a state of complete physical, mental, and spiritual, social well-being. That's the definition of health, not just the absence of disease, not just the absence of infirmity. 
Now for 5,000 years, perhaps 4,000 to 5,000 years, the ancient traditional system of medicine in India has been Ayurveda. And this system has looked after the people of India as best as possible. My focus to start off with will be on Ayurveda. Before I do so, I wish to just speak on two other systems of medicine. There may be many, but two other systems of medicine which still exist and which are still avidly practiced all over. The last part of my talk is my, my assessment of what health is at this point in time and what I envisage health should be in the future. So the two other systems of medicine which I want to speak of with, one of course is the Yunani system. Yunani system came from Greece, the Ionian. The Yunani is derived from the word Ionian. It was practiced for a thousand years in Greece. It was introduced to India by the Arabs. It consists mainly of the use of heavy metals and precious stones also. But when it came in contact with Ayurveda in India, this is about the middle in the Arab period, middle in the medieval area, uh, they borrowed the, some bits of Ayurveda, so you have herbs and other roots and other vegetative, vegetables so, you know, used in Ayurveda being also used in Yunani. The only thing is worth mentioning <clears throat> is that this was the most important practice system during the 300, 300 years of Mughal rule. The next one that I want to speak is very mundane, is folk medicine. Folk medicine has must have been there ever since Homo sapiens came into the world. Initially, you know, the diag uh, the, the, um, the the concept of hope, uh, of folk medicine was uh, related to angry gods, witchcraft, trying to get into the body of a man and making him ill, and the treatment was excortation, removing these. Again, it was from incantations, sacrifices. But that was the beginning. As it developed, it also had various small additions to this ancient medicine. Remember, the roots of medicine is magic, after all. It is from magic that medicine ultimately evolved, followed by philosophy. But anyway, it, it further evolved by taking into consideration bits and pieces of Ayurveda, which again made, made use of herbs and other substances that Ayurveda used, and the usual simple medicines that people at home employed, like for example turmeric or garlic, etc. This is what it was. Now there's a pot puri really of health givers in the city. And I came, I am giving you a small, uh, what shall I say, an amusing interlude before I speak seriously about Ayurveda. These health givers were very interesting. Every time, for example, when I came by train from Grant Road to Elphinstone Road Station and walked to the KEM hospital where I was studying, there would be a number of people sitting on the incline of Elphinstone Road Bridge. And it was a remarkable picture, amusing and interesting. For example, if there was the Ayurved who would be having a black board saying Ayurved, the spelling invariably wrong in English, but it was also in Hindi. Then there was another sad looking person who had some things in his bottle. I didn't quite know who he was, but he had no clients, but he used to come off and on. And then there was the fellow in the fez, you know, who claimed that Yunani medicine, and he would often on shout, those who want potency come here, those who want to get pregnant come here, you know. Off and on he would start, stop, start, start with that. And then there was this person who was, would read your palm and he would tell you what was wrong with you and what you should do. And then there was the lady who would lay out cards, you know, and say, pick the card and I'll tell you what is wrong. And there was one ubiquitous fellow who was always present. We called him the year specialist. 
because cleaning people's ears. And he always had a long string of clients waiting. Only one who had a string of clients waiting. We were hurrying to college, so we never stopped. But one day, there were no, no cues. So I just said, let's see what happens, see what happens. So I saw that he was cleaning the ears, and suddenly he produced a white, small substance, and said, Deko e kira hai nikla maine. He put out another substance, e deko dusra nikla. Then he put out a third one. I said, what, there are only three ossicles. He can't put out anything more. It pulled out all the ossicles. And then he said, do rupiya. I said, that was not fair, because in those days, practitioners only charged five rupees, and I could have a four and a cup of tea at the Anglo-Persian restaurant in front of the KEM hospital. He went, I said, you, but much, what are you doing? You're cheating people. You're harming people. Kaun hai aap? He said. I said, student hu? Ka student hai? Oh, KEM hospital mein. Are jao, bhai, jao. And he tells the other colleagues who were in, really, you know, they were all together. <laughs> so I was quite upset. I was walking away and then he insults me further. He said, Tum paro, paro, but jab kaan mein darar hoga, to mere paas aao. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, now the serious talk. <clears throat> Ayurveda means knowledge of longevity. Longevity is Ayur and Veda meaning wisdom, the wisdom or knowledge of longevity. Now, all great civilizations had gods of medicine. Egypt had Imhotep. He was a genuine real doctor, a real Renaissance person living in 2500 BC, mind you. He was physician and the chief priest of King Zosa in 2500 BC, a great, great doctor, described in literature, in Egyptian literature, in the Egyptian papyrus. And when he died, he was deified. In Greece, you have Asclepius. One doesn't know whether he was legendary, whether he was real, but when he finished with his, when he finished with his work, or supposed work, the, there was a cult of Imhotep and Asclepius, a double divine divinity. And the Middle East worshipped this divinity. In India, of course, we had, we had, Dhanvantrai. Now I'll tell you the legend of Dhanvantrai. It is believed that he came out from a sea of milk with the moon. With Sarabi, the sacred cow. With Varuna, the goddess of wine. With Priyakri, the tree of paradise. And with a winged horse, very much like Pegasus, of Greek mythology. He came and he saw the suffering and he said, I want to come back as a man. So he comes back as a prince in Banaras, where after some time he says he needs to write things out. He goes to a cave in the Himalayas and writes out the Ayurveda. This is legend. Even the most ardent Ayurvedas, Ayurvedas, I would say, would not believe this legend. <coughs> but I love legends. I think they add a color to the pages of history. <coughs> Perhaps, you know, though we will never know whether it's true or not, it is said that some wise rishis sometime way back at time of the Vedas went into a cave in the Himalayas and decided to discuss things as related to health and disease in man, and wrote the Ayurveda. I don't know. Nobody is going to be able to prove it or disprove it. But there are two names which I read often. One is called Agnivesh. Agnivesh was supposed to be the first teacher of Ayurveda. And he had his guru, whose name was Purna Vasu, Arithya Purna Vasu, who was supposed to be one of the great rishis who, you know, had studied and wrote on Ayurveda. I don't know. It's impossible to tell. Well, <clears throat> the two principal pillars of Ayurveda are the Charaka Samhita, going into volumes, six to eight volumes of Sanskrit, describing everything in relation to medicine, 
it had some religious stuff inside it also. And the Susruta Samhita. Charaka, a great physician, and Susruta, a great surgeon. Now, the time of work and living of Charaka is still perhaps in dispute. The Ayurveda still say that he worked in 500 BC, but that's not true. Current work shows from the Bauer's manuscript, I'll tell you about it, that Charaka probably lived around the 5th century CE, AD or CE. And the Bauer's manuscript was written on a bark. And it contained again in Sanskrit and Parikit. And it was the property of a Buddhist monk called Yoshi Mitra, who lived in a monastery somewhere at the trading point on the Great Silk Road from China to India and further. And this Yashomitra, when he died, had a stupa built at his name. This is not the stupa of Yashomitra, this is from Sanchi, but I couldn't possibly get. But he must have been a very great Buddhist priest to have a stupa, a stupa under for his name. And his small belongings were buried within the stupa, were placed inside the stupa. Now comes Colonel Hamilton Barr. He was deputed by the British government to trace the murderer of a Scottish gentleman called Mr. Delgi, who was trekking in that region. It was supposed to be an Afghan tribesman who had murdered him. So the Lieutenant Bowers, therefore, goes up in that area and at the trading post called Kuga, where where Yashomitra used to live, he sits there wondering how he used to go about it. At that point in time, some treasure hunters come, they had scooped out something from this stupa, and it was a manuscript. And they offered it to, to Lieutenant Bars, saying, would you like to buy it? He bought it because he realized it was very ancient and it might be valuable. He sent it to the Asiatic Society in Calcutta, which was a very venerable and very, very renowned society. The president of that society sent it to a person called Mr. Honley, who was a whiz in Indian languages. He translated and said, here in the book, in the translation, they said there was a renowned physician, very well known, who lived in the 5th century AD. There was another Orientalist, a French Orientalist by name Sylvain Levy, who, however, managed to get the Chinese translation of a Buddhist manuscript, in which it is said that there was a great physician called Chanakka who lived in a time in the, in, in the reign of Kanishka, and that was in 2nd century AD. So you have one second century. Fifth century, anyway, close to each other. <clears throat> but surely, I must have been much earlier than that. And there was a gentleman called Zisk who did a lot of research on this, and I read that, and he said that the roots of Ayurveda were in the ascetic milieu of the Buddhist age in the fifth, sixth century BC. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the 6th century was indeed a remarkable era or epoch in the history of man. Because it was in this century that philosophy flourished in Greece with Pythagoras, the main proponent. It was in this century that Zoroastrianism spread, Zoroastrianism spread under the belly of Asia right up to and into China. It was in this century that Isaiah preached in Judea, where Buddha preached in India, Mahavir preached in India, Confucius and Lao Tse in China. So great religions and great philosophy were born into this world. And why did this man say that it was the roots of Ayurveda were in this particular Buddhist period? For the simple reason that Buddhist documents at that time, when studied, show that the medical literature that was present in these was exactly the same as was present in the Charaka Samhita. 
It's quite possible that it extends even further back, though there is no way in which one can prove it or disprove it. But you must remember that in India the tradition was that the guru taught his student and if the student became a guru and he taught his student, so that it is possible that trickles metaphorically of knowledge, Ayurvedic knowledge, went must have gone on for a long period of time till it became visible in the Buddhist period as a stream of knowledge which ultimately was crystallized, summarized, not summarized, but crystallized and put down in Sanskrit in five or six huge volumes as the Charaka Samhita. I just want to say a few things about this Samhita, about aspects of Ayurveda. The first is the philosophy of Ayurveda. I thought that was the most wonderful thing that I read. Of all the things that I read about Ayurveda, I find that was the most exciting thing. And I do so wish that modern medicine takes that philosophy within its fold. And what did it say? He says, suffering in man can be in the body, in the mind, and in the spirit. And that he has to have a healthy mind, therefore, and a healthy body, and a healthy spirit. The philosophical, philosophical concepts transcended the medical text. For it's enjoined that the life that was worth leading was such that it should be understood that all living creatures in the world were interconnected. The next thing was that he said man's health and survival depends on nature. And it was very important for man not to disturb that fragile balance between nature and other living creatures. And also, because he's the highest living creature, he needs to protect nature, protect the ground, the earth, protect the rivers, protect the seas, protect the vegetation, protect everything within nature. Now this was amazing to me. Why? Because this is exactly what Zarathustra, somewhere around 1000 and 1500 BC, says in his gathas that you have to protect nature. And there are prayers to that effect as well. And finally, I think it was a very holistic philosophy. It said, then man was a microsome surrounded by a huge, huge, huge macrosome. And for his health and happiness, there has to be a harmony between the body, the mind, and the soul, and harmony between him and his fellow beings around him, and harmony between him and his environment, and everything that the environment contains. I think this one is neat beautiful aspect as far as the philosophy of Ayurveda goes. <clears throat> the tenets of Ayurveda I'm not particularly keen on because they said health depended upon humors and they, called, they decided there were three humors. One was pitta or bile, one was vat or air and the other was kapha which was phlegm. Amazingly even in Hippocratic times, for some reason, they had humors. Hippocrates also believed in humors. Instead of three, they had four humors, the fourth humor being blood. Isn't it intriguing that there should be this humor, tenets of, of health and disease in, 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 in different forms of medicine and different areas of medicine, whether one borrowed from the other, or both thought of this simultaneously as the best explanation for health. For when there was disharmony in these humors, there was disease. If the humors were blocked in excess, or not produced enough, or directed differently, there was disease. Well, I personally, of course, don't believe in this. I don't think that there is any such thing after the discovery of circulation by Harvey. But this is a bit still some of the Ayurveds, the die-hard Ayurveds, believe in humors. <clears throat> we come to the pharmacopoeia. And the pharmacopoeia of Ayurveda is remarkable. 
There were some 300 or 400 diseases described and there were some 700 or 800 recipes or, or drugs that we could desire to find them. I'm not an expert on this. I have never prescribed an Ayurvedic drug. All that they say is that you have all sorts of herbs and roots and flowers and petals and vegetations or vegetable matter. It also had animal matter and later on it was influenced by by the Hakims and it also had some heavy metals within it which was rather unfortunate <clears throat> because when heavy metals came into Ayurveda you had serious side effects produced as a result of heavy metals. Also they had a syringe you know and this is this syringe which reminded me of my father syringing my ears to remove my wax. It's exactly like that. But actually it is a syringe for enema, it is a syringe for injecting herbs rectally and, uh, you know, the ways in which, you know, you, they used to purge, they used to induce vomiting, they used to, uh, um, you know, give these uh, herbs via, by mouth, by, by, by the rectum, and uh, this cleaning the nostrils, whatever it is, these are some of the methods besides the medications that were used uh, orally. orally. And when you come to the Samhita itself, it had it described all diseases. I said they described 300 diseases and 700 uh, medications that were against the disease. I'm not going to go into that because it doesn't make much sense. All that you know that this is how Ayurveda was. Let me get on to Susruta, who I think was a remarkable, remarkable surgeon. Way, way, way ahead of any surgeon that you know way, way ahead of what was described in Hippocrates' Corpus Hippocratum, the surgery described there. He was a, not only a very skilled surgeon, he was a great teacher, a great teacher, and he taught at the bedside. The patient was brought to him, and he would, seat, and he would teach at the patient's side. He was a great, great, great teacher, and a great innovator. And he had some great surgical prowess, and I can only name three or four which have definitely been shown in literature. One was the cataract surgery. It was he who started cataract surgery. And this was soon spread by Buddhist monks. The technique was soon spread by Buddhist monks across India to Southeast Asia. Also, he was an expert at lithotomy. That is the removal of a stone from the bladder. That's really remarkable. Also, also, he was very expert at removing a dead fetus from the uterus. And most important of all, he was the father of plastic surgery. I shall deal with that in a few minutes, in a few moments. And you can see what an innovator he was with the number of instruments he innovated. If you see these instruments, they're remarkable. If you notice, this, there's one thing peculiar about these instruments. Every instrument has the head of an animal. Isn't that strange? It just shows the link between man and other living creatures, if you ask me. Now what happens, a strange thing happens. After Susruta's demise, surgery went into a decline. It's amazing. The only reason one can think of it is that the caste system was sharply divided in sharp lines. And therefore the Brahmins, who were mainly the Ayurveds, must have had some, some feeling not to touch people who are below their caste. And therefore they preferred to treat with medication and not with the knife. But not to worry. The barber surgeons come into play. The barber surgeons took up surgery. They are not to be laughed at. Many of them were very good surgeons, mind you. I'm thinking of the great barber surgeon in the West, Ambroise Paré in the Renaissance time. He is even today considered one of the greats of surgery in Western medicine. So they were not to, to be laughed at. The barber surgeons really took over. And now an amusing story again. There was a Parsi gentleman who used to ride a bullock cart and he was in the pay of the English during the war between the English and Tipu Sultan sometime in, I think, 1791. 
And the soldiers of Tipu Sultan captured him. They chopped off one hand and they chopped off his nose. He didn't mind his hand being chopped off. He was very upset that his Parsi aquiline long nose was no longer with him. So he wanted this nose to be repaired. You must remember that Susruta had a tremendous advantage over other surgeons and other parts, other, other fields, other civilization, because the punishment for adultery in India was the nose of the female was cut off. So he had a tremendous practice in repairing this nose. And this is how this man's nose was repaired. Not, not, not by a barber surgeon, not by an Ayurved who had been trained in the school of Susruta Ayurvedic medicine, by an ordinary bricklayer. The point was, at that point in time, any individual who was adept with his fingers, you know, would practice surgery. This was an ordinary bricklayer. And this was the practice that, show me the earlier one. Flap. This is Susratas, a flap cut from the cheek, a skin flap, and then shifted over onto the nose, waiting for time to repair. And he had a good nose. She had a good nose. Show me the other one now, please. The next one. No, before that, this one. This is the remarkable. This is the one that this bricklayer used to repair poor old Kavasi's nose. A leaf is placed over the destroyed nose, and this leaf is placed on the forehead, and it is cut, rather, a, a, a diagram is made, a skin removed, and it is turned over over the nose so that the nose stays repaired. Now, this, this procedure was witnessed by two senior presidency surgeons in the presidency of Bombay. And they passed it on into the Indian Gazette. And the Indian Gazette passed it on to so-called, they called it the Gentleman's Magazine in London. I thought they would put it into the Lancet, but the Lancet came after that. So it was in the Gentleman's Magazine, and it was read by an English, young English surgeon. And this young English surgeon took note of it, tried it on in patients of his where a nose had to be repaired for some reason or the other, and he reported it as the Hindu method of repairing the nose. And believe you me, you know, you will, I will tell you later, this really plastic surgical procedure had been passed on to Europe in the, by the 14th or the 15th century, but it lay quiet till this gentleman, till this English surgeon put it into practice so that the whole of the UK and the whole subsequently of Europe became aware of it. Now I want to give you some information on other aspects of Ayurveda. Was I know, I must tell you one thing. Ayurveda didn't remain confined to India. It was translated into Sinhalese, into Nepalese, and to Burmese. Not only that, but during the Arab time, when the Arabs were there, and before that, of course, Iran was there, and it was translated into Palvi. And strangely, how did this happen? Kusho Nariman of the Sasanian dynasty, who was a rather warrior emperor of the Sasanian period, sent his prime minister, who was also a physician, to India. He goes there, and he goes into the court of Vikramaditya, the legendary Vikramaditya, a Kushan emperor. And there he becomes great friends with him. He becomes his, one of his ministers. He stays there for many years, learns Sanskrit. And when he goes, he carries a lot of Sanskrit manuscripts with him back to his kingdom. And therefore, this was translated into Pahalvi. So one of the first languages in which this Sanskrit literature was translated was in Pahalvi. During the Arab time, of course, the literature, the Sanskrit literature, literature Charaka Samhita and Susutra Samhita, were translated into Arabic. And 
It was a time of the Abbasid Empire, and there were many physicians from India working in the Abbasid Empire in the great capital of Baghdad, which was one of the greatest capitals at that point in time. It's also interesting that in the Abbasid period, there were two great Arab physicians, Avicenna and Rezes. They were great scholars. In fact, you know, the text written by Avicenna was called the Canon. It was translated into Latin. You won't believe it, it was a standard text of medicine in the West till the 16th century. Anyway, Avicenna, the great scholar, translated this into Latin, and this was went into Europe, particularly Italy and Sicily. So there you are, how, how Ayurveda spread to Europe, and first to Italy and to Sicily. <clears throat> Let me tell you something more. Is Ayurveda a science? <clears throat> The Ayurvedans say, of course, it is a big science, has been always a science. And there is a lot of research, and a good bit of research is done by people outside India, by foreigners, we call them foreigners, you know, the English particularly, but more than English, French and German. These are two outside people who have done a fair amount of research on Ayurveda. And I think they're right when they say, that Ayurveda was not really a science. But you can't compare, for example, a science that exists, say, in the 20th century to a science that was found, founded 5,000 years or 3,400 years back. But even to the 18th or the 19th century, you have to admit that it was not a science. And I quote exactly what this man says, why it was not a science. He says, there was no quantification. There was no experimentation. There was no verification. There was no falsification. There were theories which were not founded exactly on evidence. And also there were theories which were fossilized. They did not change. Everyone knows that the history of medicine is a chronicle of change. And if the theories were fossilized, obviously, it can't be good. Theories change, always, from time to time. So that's why it was not really a sub But it was a great system in which empiricism, empirical observation was present. You saw something, you said this was good in this symptom group or this symptom complex, therefore it is useful for that. That is what is meant by empiricism. In Western medicine comes last on the point of view of evidence. But it's not to be discarded or not to be laughed at. Some of the great, some of the great discoveries even in Western medicine were related to empiricism. To give you an example, Jenna, who observed that uh, women, you know, who had cowpox and never had smallpox. That was a great observation. That was how smallpox vaccination started. Semmelweis, who observed that washing hands reduce maternal mortality markedly. And washing hands is one of the most crucial aspects of all medicine, including Western medicine, more so now than ever. So empiricism is not to be really laughed at. Right, now we come to a point in the history of Ayurveda when one feels sad. Because after the 10th century, particularly in the Renaissance period, it seemed that Ayurveda went to sleep, fell into a maya for all practical purposes, particularly when you compare it with what happened in the West, from the Renaissance period particularly. Whereas in the West, ultimately, till that time they were more or less even. There was not much difference in therapy from the point of view of recovery of patients. There was not much therapy in Western medicine also, at that point in time. But from the Renaissance, there was a sudden change in Western medicine. There was a tremendous sense of inquiry, wanting to know, wanting to explore. And the first change came in the natural sciences. You had Newton and Kepler. You had Galileo. You had Mendel. 
you had Darwin. You had Curies who discovered radium, as you know, Ronjan who discovered the X-ray. And numerous other people, not forgetting Einstein, Planck, and several physicists, chemists, chemists and later geneticists. These were all discoveries in natural sciences. Then, slowly, pari passu, came discoveries in medicine, like Vesalius, the father of anatomy. Leonardo also would be considered the father of anatomy, only at that time his anatomical drawings were lost and were found much later. You had, uh, for example, Pasteur, and you had Cox, and Simmelweis, as I told you. You had uh, so many others. Ultimately, I want to speak of Fleming, because it is from the discovery of pen penicillin by Fleming that it is believed modern Western medicine, from the point of view of therapy, started. And following that, there was a spate of discovery. So that science and technology, advancing at such a rapid space, which continues to advance, has changed the face of medicine, as far as medicine, medicine goes. What happened to Ayurveda? I can only think of Raman, his work on light. I can think of Bose on his work on plant physiology. But there were no other shining lights, still Baba and his work in atomic physics with his team. There were no discoveries. There was no medication. There were no great therapeutic advances which could combat severe disease. None whatsoever. There was no Ayurvedic medicine that could treat severe pneumonia or meningitis or an abscess here, or an abscess there, or severe infections anywhere, HIV infections, nothing. You couldn't compare surgical prowess of what was happening in the West with the surgical prowess in the Ayurvedic period at that time and age. It was extraordinarily disheartening. So what is one to do, I ask you? What is the poor Indian who has either no access to modern medicine or cannot afford modern medicine. What is it to do? I think, isn't it the duty of the past that be to at least try and ensure that some aspect of modern medicine, even the small aspect of modern medicine, is given to these people? I cannot but feel that the poor Indian, the Indian living in distant rural areas and villages that dot the landscape of this country, Indians, poor Indians living in tribal areas, the marginalized Indian, the trampled upon Indian, the outcasted Indian, even the Indian living in the large slums of our cities deserves a much better deal with regard to his or her health. I cannot imagine, if you ask me, how these poor people can bear the lot with such equanimity and fortitude. Perhaps it's the belief in uh, great faith in God. Perhaps it's the belief in karma, in religion. Perhaps it's their belief that what matters the body, the spirit, the soul is always there. It was, isn't it in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, which says, never the spirit was born, the spirit will never cease to be. Never was the time it was not. Birthless, deathless, Changeless remaineth the spirit forever. Death had not touched it at all. Dead to the house of it may be. This is what is, I think, buried in the collective consciousness of our poor Indian people. But this has to change. 
Does it mean that because of that you're not going to give some benefit of modern medicine to them? Isn't it the first principle, ethical principle, that you need, you need, you need, you need beneficence? Shouldn't we have beneficence for them? Before I go further, I want to say one more thing. And that is the importance of faith in all medicine, particularly so in old medicine, very much so. In Egyptian medicine, in Greek medicine, you have Asclepius, for example. You know, he had people had faith in him. They would go down and lie down in his temple. The next morning they would say they were well. Faith is so important. You look at, for example, in the West, Lourdes, faith in the Virgin Mary. So similarly in Portugal, in Spain, in South America, in Mexico, the psyche of the Indian, particularly the poor Indian living in the villages, is simply governed by faith in religion and prayer. We must remember that. And this is more so in the ancient times. So that, uh, you know, if he was ill or he wanted health, he would travel miles to a place of worship which he feels might give him that. So you had places like, for example, Shirdi in near Bombay, or you have places like the Golden Temple for the Sikhs, you had in Kashmir you have Hazrat Lal, you know, in, in, and so many other places. So many other places. You have Ajmer, the Durga of Ajmer, they will travel to these places, and if they are too ill, they have proxies who go in on their behalf. But I also want to stress faith between the doctor and the patient. It is so important. There is a bond between a doctor and a patient which is really at the heart of all medicine. It is a bond which encourages trust between the doctor and the patient, reinforcing an unwritten covenant which has been hallowed by time. Now, this bond, you know, is not produced by the science of medicine, ladies and gentlemen. It is produced by the art of medicine. It is the art of medicine which will enable a doctor to reach down to a shattered morale of a very sick person, help it, and also perhaps soothe the distress in the mind of such a patient. But it is an art, I'm afraid, which is... Uh, which is forgotten, which is lies in the background. I think it is the mechanization of medicine and the hubris of its science and technology that has thrown this art into the shadows. It is a forgotten art. I only hope it doesn't become a lost art because that would be a tragedy for both man and medicine. Well, now Ayurveda has nothing as I said in modern age, for the very sick man. I would like to conclude first with a conjecture. Can we combine Ayurveda with modern medicine? They call it biomedicine now. No, I don't think it's possible. To form a corpus of medicine which is universal, I don't think that's possible for several reasons which I won't go into. Then I would like to make a couple of statements. The first is that, that I feel that Ayurveda must, must develop a greater scientific temper for it to relate to times in future. It has to do so. But please don't think that modern biomedicine is great. Today, modern biomedicine is solely focused on science and technology, oblivious of the art of medicine, 
oblivious of the philosophy of medicine, oblivious of the social aspects of medicine, oblivious of the many other endeavors of man that have left its print on medicine. Now, to be solely concerned, focus only on the science and technology of medicine is dangerous. Because science and technology can run amok. And it is extremely important that ethical constraints are laid down. It is extremely important that with every advance of medicine, science, technology, there are ethical constraints which guide it, restrict it, and direct it only towards the benefit of humanity. If not, we are in danger. Homo sapiens will no longer be there. Homo sapiens may disappear and you find another species on Earth. And even the, the safety of our planet may be seriously jeopardized. So that's another statement. Now, there's one thing which really I have been thinking of for quite some time within my mind. I said, you know, you should take the fruits of modern medicine to some extent to the people, to the, to the, to the, to the poor, to the people who are marginalized, poor, who cannot afford, who cannot have access to it. If that be done, would it really improve the health of the country in the true sense of the word? Prevention is better than cure, and I think preventing disease, boosting health, guarding health is far better than trying to put together the fragmented pieces of a disordered health produced by disease and then set right by medicine. I therefore would like to share one thought with you, and that is that the successful treatment of disease is not the sole arbiter of health. Now, what would, I, what would I wish for the health of the country? Foremost, first and foremost, is something every one of you will agree with me. I would wish that public health measures are enforced. A moratorium is placed on everything else related to health with regard, as far as the government goes. And for two or three, four years, public health measures are enforced. Which means good water, good nutrition, good habitation, good sanitation, vaccination, good education. Education particularly of the girl. I can't tell you how important education is. It is extremely important. It's just not the teaching of the sciences and humanities. Education really involves inculcating honesty, integrity, a way of living, a way of thinking, a compassion, caring for others. This is what should be instilled in the young student. And I think it is at school that the child spends more time even than at home. So I can't tell you how important schools are. And for good schools, you need very good teachers. This brings to mind a, a very nice quote from the Divine Comedy by Dante. Dante was being shown round all the circles of health, of death, of, you know, of hell. And he was being taken round one after the other, deeper and deeper and deeper. And he comes to the last worst circle where all people are in agony. And he finds that one of those was somebody he knew. And he asks this person, how come you come here? How do you come here? In the last circle of health, suffering like this? And he gives a beautiful answer. He says, it was at school that I learned to Odante to tread the path that was to lead me here. So you realize how important schools are. Besides what I have said, is there any other way in which one can improve the health? I've said most of the things I wanted to say. Yes, perhaps if you could 
improve the living standard of the poor Indian. This might sound to you simplistic, but I think it is important. Besides everything else I've said, and what would be required for that? Of course, a burgeoning economy. You can't possibly do that without a very quickly advancing economy. I repeat, education again too. And the last thing, I think, is improving the social environment of the person. Why do I say that? After all, isn't health defined as, isn't it defined as a complete physical, mental, and social well-being? Look at the three, equal, body, mind, and social well-being. And social well-being is important, therefore. You can't have good, you can't have good medicine, you know, in a place, you know, where there is mayhem in society. Social well-being means, social well-being means that you need, uh, you need, how should I put it, not so much caring for society as recognizing people like you. And we are caring for them in a way. What else? You need a good social milia. Milia. Milia is a French word also used in English. And how do you get a good social milia? By also advocating harmony. By tolerance. Tolerance to different faiths. Tolerance to a clash of different ideas. And of course, to good governance. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.